Greetings, Zero and Repeater Books readers. I'm very pleased to bring to you this conversation with Chris Nino about his upcoming book, Radical Chains, Why Class Matters. Chris is a highly prolific author and activist, but to name some of his achievements, he is a significant contributor to the British revolutionary socialist group Counterfire, as well as the Stop the War Coalition, and has been published three times already with Zero Books, The People vs. Tony Blair, how the establishment lost control, and the British state, a warning. His fourth book with Zero, Radical Chains, offers a compelling and synoptic analysis of the global socialist movement from the mid-1800s with Marx and Engels to the present day. Its purpose is to argue that class is finally back on the agenda after decades of neoliberal repression. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to be on here, Kenny. And thanks for that introduction. <laughs> My pleasure. Well, to start us off with, would you mind sharing with our listeners a little bit about yourself, specifically your personal history, and how this brought you to the subject of your latest book? Well, I was, um, I'm unfortunately old enough to remember, um, at least um, dimly as a kid, uh, the last great period of working class struggle in Britain in the 1970s and to um, have some sort of a feeling about its impact in society because it was, you know, there were huge strikes in the 70s, we brought down the Tory government, um, basically stopped the energy industry, um, stopped the mines, there was a three day week, there were blackouts. Um, the, the power of working class action is really etched on my memory. As a, as a very young person. And then I was, I was actually able to be um, involved in the kind of support and solidarity work for the big strike in a series of strikes in the 1980s, but most memorably the miners' strike in Britain, where there was more than the miners went out for more than a year. Um, the strike was the main issue, the main event, the main news story day after day after day, week after week, because it was a, you know, it was a dispute that determined the future of the direction of British society. We, and it was clear that it was going to do that at the time. And it's even clearer that uh, the defeat of the miners has, um, has that kind of historical significance now. So I, I kind of have that, you know, have that experience in my past. Um, but also I was in a way lucky enough to be involved quite centrally in, um, uh, in the last couple of decades, the, first of all, the anti-capitalist movement, which kind of the resurgence of the left that took place at the end of the nineties and in the beginning of the, uh, two thousands with the, the Apple and the big protests in, in, uh, Genoa and Nice and then yeah. European social forum and the, you know, the really quite significant, um, uh, international uh, movement against capitalist modification and against the impacts that capital was having, which, by the way, is a movement that I think is a little bit written out of history now, um, but was very, very important uh, in terms of shaping the politics of the last couple of decades. Then I was um, one of the founding members of the Stop the War Coalition and very involved in the kind of international movement against the Iraq war and over Afghanistan and Syria and so forth. Now, to me, those two things, the anti-capitalist movement, the anti-war movement, um, were the kind of, you know, the left coming back, the movement, the radical movements coming back after years of defeat and, um, and uh, demoralization. What they didn't have, they had, a, they had an extraordinary kind of, um, element of generalization to them. You know, it's, it's one of the things I say in the book is that some of the sort of pessimistic comments that are made by various figures on the left at the turn of the, uh, of the century where, you know, Frederick Jameson famously said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine end cap the end of, the end of um, capitalism. Always struck me as being bizarre because he made that comment precisely at the time when anti capitalism became popular again. And there were all these people protesting and demonstrating around the world, literally saying another world is possible. 
Um, so, you know, there was a real generalization and, and uh, you know, millions of young people, both in the global north and in the global south, were out on the streets, were protesting at the IMF, the World Trade Organization, the GA, surrounding these conferences, you know, creating really quite an enormous impact in uh, quite a big impact in society. Then the anti-war movement, which also, although it was about the Iraq war, it was about so much else, was, you know, it, it, it drew, it developed a kind of international anti-imperialist politics that then went on to have an impact um, in wider movements, uh, I think, uh, later on in the, uh, in the last two decades. So I think you've had despite the pessimism of many on the left, you've had in the last two, uh, since 2000, you've had um, very, very generalised mass protest movements with a strong element of radicalism, of radicalism in them. What you haven't had is the kind of connection to real dual class struggle based in workplaces, based in the trade unions, based in the wider working class movement. And I suppose in a way, what I feel the impetus behind this book is me feeling what we need is to bring those two experiences together. We need to bring the power of the working class that was so evident to millions of people in the 1970s, not just in Britain, but, but you know, in, in large parts of the world, the power of the working class, the capacity of the working class to, to bring society to a standstill um, with the political generalization that I think has been a feature of the last two decades. And, you know, what has actually happened on the left is that in that period of neoliberalism, you've seen, at least among sections of the left, you've seen a move away from the idea of class being central. You've seen a move away from not just class uh, as an analytical tool, but the idea, which is so central to the history of socialism, the idea that, the working class people, all the, the organised working class, is the the the, the agency is the is the potential um, agent of fundamental change. And really, what I'm doing is to try and argue for an updated version of that thought in the context of of you know the the 2020s. Well, it's interesting that you mention this association for you between the anti-war movement and the anti-capitalist movement. There's another guest I've had on the show a couple times now, uh, Aaron Leonard, who uh, is an American author, uh, most of whose experiences are in kind of 20th century Maoism with the Revolutionary Union and the Revolutionary Communist Party. Um, so he talks a lot about this as well. And it seems like uh, in America, there was a similar experience with the Vietnam War um, being this are being seen as this opportunity by many left-wing groups to restart this conversation about anti-capitalism and say the inevitability of American imperialism under a uh, capitalist political economy. Um, but you also said right at the start there that your background in anti-capitalism more or less starts with the famous minor strikes. Um, and something I've noticed is that in the context of the nurses' strikes, the, the postie strikes, etc. Uh, that seems to be a real cultural moment that a lot of people are returning to and talking about again. Uh, but I always, I always tend to get the feeling in these kind of um, cultural reminiscences, let's say, that there's the risk of some kind of misappropriation or misapprehension of the original historic moment. So is there anything strange that you've noticed about the way that uh, the minor strikes are being spoken of today? In, in reference to all of this industrial happening right now that maybe doesn't quite accord with your own experience of it at the time? Well, I mean, I'd say the main thing, my main observation about that would be that clearly we have, you know, actually since I started writing this book, uh, in Britain at least and in some other countries, including um, definitely France, arguably to some extent in the United States, we're seeing a return of class struggle, of workplace-based class struggle, which is, you know, very, very welcome. Um, I'd say in a way that there's not enough discussion about history uh, to provide some sort of context, to provide some sort of 
um, analytical tools to look at what's going on at the moment. So I'm in favor of, you know, which is one of the reasons why I did write the book, actually. I'm in favor of trying to go back to some of those experiences to learn about their strengths and weaknesses, to learn um, about the potential impact of, of close struggle, to learn from some of the strategies that were adopted in those times, but also to look at the failings, uh, the failures and the, and, and the weaknesses of them. So um, I'm for more of that, you know, more of that discussion. Um, and I think uh, one of the things, one of the problems that I do identify in the book is that in retrospect, even, you know, in the, in the immediate aftermath of the miners' strike, there was a section of the left who basically felt that the defeat of the miners and similar defeats that took place in other countries around the same time um, because there was a real, you know, there was a real uh, kind of series of, of, of similar set-piece conflicts between capital and labour um, in the 1980s, not just in Europe, but also in India, in um, parts of Latin America and so on. There was, a, there was a tendency for the left to sort of see those defeats as being somehow inevitable. And, you know, it's at that point really, well, actually, that moment kind of accelerates the move amongst some of the left intelligentsia towards the idea that the working class no longer has a kind of specific way in society. The working class no longer really has power. If they can beat the miners, you know, that means that we can't win anymore. And it means that something fundamental and structural has changed in society. There was this thing, New Times, that was a... Um, a description of a whole set of political ideas that developed in Britain around that period, where it was, you know, people are no longer um, primarily producers in society. We're more consumers. Um, what happens in the workplace is no longer seen as being massively important to people. It's about leisure time. It's about how we experience the wider, um, uh, you know, the, the, the wider kind of elements of capitalist society that are important. It's not all about trade unions anymore. There was a kind of, you know, it's sort of like saying this was inevitable, saying that these defeats were structured into the situation. And what I want to do in this book, what I tried to do in this book, is to say not just about those struggles, but about other historical struggles, that victory was possible. That, you know, the question of the kind of politics, the kind of organisation, the way the left... Um, organizes and uh, and tries to build solidarity the way the left intervenes the way the left the arguments the left puts the kind of political approach that dominate in these struggles is often decisive much more decisive than uh than is sometimes argued there's a tendency to just kind of you know see everything in a kind of objectified way that these this trend away from the working class was something that was built into neoliberalism, built into the economy, which I don't think is true at all. I think those defeats were actually, you know, massively pivotal um, and could have been avoided. Hmm. Well, uh, obviously the subtitle of your book is Why Class Matters. And this is an enormous question, but I'd like to get into the heart of your argument in the book right away. Uh, in my opinion, this argument is kind of an attempt to balance the continued relevance writings on socialism from the 19th century with recognition of the ways that capitalism and the organization of labor changed since Marx and Engels' time. That's one of the things that I particularly appreciate about your book. You, you don't uh, treat contemporary capitalism as though it hadn't, as though there weren't any major changes within it relative to what Marx and Engels were talking about. So how do you go about balancing these two claims that things have changed in deep ways but that Marx and Engels' work remains relevant for understanding and responding to inequality today. Well, I think that, it, as you say, capitalism has changed massively. The point is, it hasn't changed in the ways that uh, most commentators uh, identify or believe. Like, actually, there's been a huge, you know, particularly the last four decades of neoliberalism, has been a massive restructuring. Uh, there's been a massive increase in outsourcing. There's been a massive globalization of production chains. 
there's been um, a huge kind of uh, technological uh, transformations, new technologies, new industries um, have been uh, developed. There's been the kind of emergence of what's called the service economy on a huge scale. Um, these things are, you know, sh- are enormous um, developments in society. They change people's experience and they have a, they've had a traumatic effect actually on the lives of working people um, both in the North uh, and in the South. Um, however, what their implications are um, is something we have to look at very, very carefully because one of the things the neoliberalism has, has, de- has led to is an intensification of exploitation, actually. Um, and this had all sorts of uh, implications. One is, despite all the talk about the end of the working class, despite all the talk about, you know, we live in a friction-free, productless economy, all these theories that have been developed and pursued over the last um, few decades, the reality is the working class, those people who work for um, a, uh, a wage in the world has now become the majority of c- in society for the first time. The International Labour Organization, I think in 2014, announced basically the majority of the people uh, of the population of the world were for the first time workers. It became for the first time workers in that year. So Contrary to the to the myth, contrary to the um, caricatures, actually the working class has grown in this period. The number of people who are being uh, exploited by capital for a profit has risen. Um, and one of the great changes since Marx's day is encapsulated in that because there are now uh, more workers in South Korea than there were workers in the whole of the globe when Karl Marx was writing. Um, and if you want to look at any of the kind of indices of, of, of uh, change, what you find is, yeah, capitalism has always been developing. There's always been um, uh, transforming the way production is made. There's always been moving on from industry to industry, from um, extractive industries to uh, engineering and um, from development, obviously, more recently of the Um, of the new um, high-tech industries. This is a kind of feature, this kind of constant transformation is a feature of capitalism that Marx actually wrote about. But this doesn't mean that people aren't exploited. This doesn't mean there aren't huge workplaces. And this doesn't mean that uh, workers don't have tremendous power still. I mean, I was looking at the, uh, the figures the other day. This, there's a, this biggest factory in the world biggest industrial kind of enterprise in the world uh, is um, in Shenzhen, in China, the Longhua Production Park, which employs, uh, estimates vary, but employs between 250 and 300,000 people in one industrial enterprise. Now, when Frederick Engels was writing about the condition of the English working class in Manchester in the 1840s, he was impressed by a factory that employed 2,000 people or 3,000 people. You know, he thought that was unbelievable. So, you know, this notion that somehow the working class has, 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 has been disappeared, has dissolved, no longer exists, no longer has power, no longer has, plays an important role in the economy, is a total myth. And there are all sorts of ways in which, um, you know, even the developments over the last 20, 30 years has created new concentrations of workers. This is the, the kind of production in China and, and other parts of East Asia of uh, where a lot of their IT production is concentrated. But there's also logistics. I mean, if you look at the, which is obviously a product of, of kind of global production chains and globalization in general, if you look at the logistics industry, if you look at the giant hubs that have been generated all around the globe where goods are transported and moved and distributed around, um, you find there are concentrations of tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of workers in around poor areas, around uh, airports. There's a big hub in Britain around Heathrow Airport 
where you have these huge concentrations of worms um, who are very much who are engaged in the kind of you know the distribution of goods, um, and uh, because of the kind of just in current production methods, any disruption that happens in those uh, in those hubs has a massive and immediate impact upstream and downstream, not just on the that particular company's profits, but on the whole you know movement of goods and the whole functioning of the capitalist economy. So. Yeah, it's not just the working class still exists. It's not just that it's still concentrated. In fact, it's much more concentrated in um, areas of uh, in, in you know, big workplaces and big production centres and, and, and work centres. It's also the working class still objectively has a huge amount of power to disrupt, to, um, to bring the system uh, to a halt if they take if workers take action. And I think this is, you know, this is one of the central messages of the book. Um, so so the, the, there's that whole range of questions around the actual physical nature of the working class nowadays. And then there's the second thing, which is, um, you know, what the, the kind of importance of these questions for Marx, because for Marx and the early socialists, um, this wasn't just a matter of power, although power is important. It's also a question of, the, you know, the, the, the way in which society can be transformed. Because Marx's argument was uh, the working class, unlike previous radical classes, unlike the, say, the emerging bourgeoisie uh, at the time of the, of the French Revolution, at the time when, you know, uh, feudalism was being challenged by um, revolutionary movements in different parts of the world, Unlike the, the emergent bourgeoisie, the working class has no interest in oppressing anyone or exploiting anyone. The working class can only um, change society by ending class, actually, by bringing the whole, um, the whole structure of class society down. The working class can only liberate itself by liberating the whole of society. And that's what Marx talked about when, that's what Marx meant when he said that the working class is, is a universal class. In order to succeed, it can only uh, it, it has to end oppression. It has to end all all forms of exploitation. Um, and this is very important. That's really what the slightly enigmatic title to radical chains um, is about. Because you know what? That's actually a quote from Marx. He said that the way workers are oppressed and exploited um, form a kind of radical. Uh, radical change. They form a kind of um, uh, imprisonment which can only be ended by the liberation of the whole of humanity and the whole of society. And this is very important. And it sounds like quite an ambitious and philosophical thought. But I think it's very, very important that working class struggle, um, I argue in the book, is at the, is at the kind of root of, of, of all the great insurgent um, transform, transformational movements in history, and it's it's really at the at the heart of uh, generating radical ideas. The very the very idea that we can fundamentally transform society really historically has depended on working class struggle and on the kind of ideas that have been generated in the organisations and the uh, and the and the um, ambitions that have been generated out of those struggles over the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's interesting uh, to me particularly that you mentioned the logistics industry. Uh, I was actually just reading an article um, on uh, uh, logistics strikes in Argentina because uh, that seems to be, at least Latin America seems to be a region of the world in which the, log the logistics industry is particularly concentrated and in which it holds... Uh, a very significant amount of, let's say, in associational power, uh, at least as this article I was reading was contending. Uh, it's from Robert Ovet's anthology, uh, Workers' Inquiry and Global Class Struggle, I think the book is called. Um, <laughs> uh, he, uh, one of the contributors to the anthology points out that uh, the government of Argentina has been uh, stalling uh, some critical logistical developments say, in the creation of uh, a national railway and the understanding that the shift from 
uh, 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 independent truckers to a national railway would give so much more strength to the logistical unions organizing in the country. Um, but that's just a, a side anecdote that I find really interesting that in many ways, class struggle is very, very intense in certain parts of the world right now, like Argentina, or even at the moment in Britain, of course. Um, but sorry, back to the book. One part of the history <laughs> that you recounted this in, in Radical Chains is the failure of Keynesianism to provide solutions to inequality and exploitation that workers needed across the 20th century. But today, Keynesianism seems to be experiencing this second wind. In fact, while I was reading Radical Chains, I was also reading a book by the contemporary Keynesian economist, Yanis Varoufakis. But the history he presents of the 20th century is very, very different from the one that you do. And he seems to exclude the reality of class struggle from his depiction of the creation of modern social institutions, like the NHS, for example. Uh, would it be possible for you to outline uh, what you think are some of the reasons for which Keynesianism failed? I remember there's this fantastic discussion of this subject in your book. And share with us what your alternative to uh, say, uh, inequality and exploitation apart or solving problems of inequality and exploitation apart from Keynesianism. Uh, what would your alternative solution be like? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, it's very welcome that, that Keynesianism um, is back in a way because what we're talking about, presumably, or what Yanis is talking about is <clears throat> that there have been over the last few years, been I mean, a series of um, political projects from Corbynism to the Sanders project. Um, we have La France Insoumise, um, obviously Podemos and Syriza and so forth, all of which are electoral projects which have um, rejected neoliberalism and have been trying to move towards a situation where there's you know more planning, more welfare, um, a challenge for inequality, all of these things. And in that sense, you know, this is part of the resurgence and um, revival of the left and is very, very important. And, and an attempt to find a political expression to the anger on the left that people feel. Having said that, I think it's also important that to recognise that um, none of those projects have actually succeeded in any way. And in a way, they've all come... Some of them have failed quite spectacularly. And, and, and I think we're moving towards a moment where there's a, a sense of, you know, crisis, actually, a political crisis uh, uh, in, in, in those, uh, in the experience of, of failure or generated by the experience of failure of those, of those projects. And I mean, I, I have a chapter on the period after the Second World War between the, between the uh, Second World War and the, um, the great explosion of resistance in, in, in the late 60s and early 70s. And what I argue there uh, is that the kind of standard view, even the standard view on the left, that there was kind of a class compromise in that period and that there was a sort of agreement between capital and workers that more would be spent on welfare and that, uh, that uh, basically, you know, there'll be an increase in standard, in the standard of living and wages and that, things would, de would, would gradually improve and this would be good for everyone. I mean, my argument is that that wasn't what, what happened, that, that actually there was fundamentally, though, first of all, there was a, at the end of the Second World War, there was a big popular um, mood for change um, coming out of the 1930s, coming out of um, the, uh, the rise of fascism and the experience of fighting fascism. And then in some countries in Europe, there were, you know, major and, and quite often ignored working class movements that played a central role in removing the fascists in France, in Italy, in Greece. Um, you know, the, 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 the fascists were chased out there in some parts of those countries by a working class movement, essentially, which, which is important to remember. And that, the way that the ruling class responded to this at the end of the Second World War was, uh, or responded, or, or um, the kind of policy they developed in the Second World War, well, partly uh, due to their need to contain these movements. 
and to, um, you know, the Marshall Plan was very much an attempt to kind of make Europe safe for capitalism post Second World War and it, after the, 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 the collapse of many societies. So you have that on the one hand. On the other hand, you have the long boom. And I think without the long boom, you wouldn't have got um, these kind of, you know, the, the, the welfare, the, the developments that we've talked about to anything like the same degree. So it was really the, un the unprecedented boom from the mid to late 40s right through to the end of the 1960s, which was almost you know, uninterrupted, where you had a high level of profitability, meant that uh, bosses could be quite easily persuaded to spend a bit more on education, on uh, the health service and so on and so forth. Um, that was really quite decisive in, in shaping that period. And funnily enough, I, it, the, the kind of Keynesian punk priming policy didn't really kick in until the early 1960s. So I don't think you can argue convincingly or plausibly that it was Keynesian economics that created the long boom. I think the long boom was generated by other things, really, which we probably haven't got time to go into, but I would argue largely by arms spending and by the militarization of the, um, of the, uh, of the West and, um, and actually the uh, Soviet Union and so on. Anyway, what brought all this to an end, and, and, and I think what, um, you know, what we, we need to say about the kind of failure of, of that period, uh, the failure of what was regarded as being the period of Keynesianism, is that by the end of the 60s and the early 70s, rates of profits were plummeting across the, the Western uh, world and beyond. And so the long boot, you know, came to an end. And it came to an end on the watch of the Keynesians. Uh, it came to an end just at the time when uh, it was, you know, the whole of the, really, the whole of the ruling class was brought into the Keynesian, um, the Keynesian project, ironically. Um, so, so I don't, I, yeah, I don't really um, buy the idea of the, the period as being one of class compromise. I don't buy the idea of it being a period that was, um, uh, uh, shaped mainly by that particular form of economics. And uh, I think it came to an end because of, um, obviously there were various international shocks that took place in the 19th, that, that, that happened globally in the 1970s. But really the key thing was the rate of profit started to decline. The bosses had to do something about that. The ruling class had to respond to, um, uh, a situation where they, their profits were being uh, radically squeezed. And that was really the basis of the kind of neoliberal uh, uh, shock therapy that was introduced in the late 70s and early 80s in most parts of the world. Now, uh, you've mentioned the rate of profit a couple of times now. Um, and just from my experiences with other Marxists and uh, other kind of activists and militants across the UK, a lot of people really struggle to understand and see the import of Marx's crisis theory. Uh, so just for our listeners then, would it be possible for you to just give uh, a quick explanation of uh, like tendency of rate of profit to fall, what you mean by rate of profit, and how this relates to the development of the capitalist economy? Sorry, that's possibly too large of a question. <laughs> well, I mean, could, could you explain book three of capital, please? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, every crisis has its own particularities and is precipitated and caused by different um, particular uh, elements. So, you know, you can't talk about there being a kind of uh, one-size-fits-all uh, analysis of, of, it, of, of, of crisis, but underlying them is this long-term tendency of the uh, the rate of profit, which is quite simply the amount of money capitalists make from a particular chunk of investment, um, to to decline. There are countervailing tendencies, and and the the greatest example of that those countervailing tendencies was the period after the Second World War, 
But the, I mean, you know, I think it's now widely accepted that if you look at all the data, um, what you find is that there was a very, very sharp increase in the rate in the rate of profit in the late forties, right through, and it sort of peaked in the, in the mid sixties, and then a decline, a progressive decline um, uh, from that point forward, and and this is built into the the capitalist system because what's in the interest of one section of capital is not in the interest of the system as a, of a whole uh, as a whole because every every um capitalist wants to produce goods at the cheapest possible price which means spending a lot of money on plant and tech and um uh and um sorry it means spending a lot of money on um uh, on technology on um uh, machinery uh, and investing massively in the latest technology. Problem, that's fine for the individual capitalist uh, because they end up producing their goods cheaper than their competitors. Problem for the system as a whole is that as the proportion of capital that is spent on technology rises, um, the proportion spent on wages declines and it actually uh, the work of working people is actually labor, human labor only that in the end of the day can produce surplus value. So what you find is you're spending more and more money on um, technology, less and less on, as a proportion, less and less on wages. And therefore, overall in the system, the amount of profit that is being generated uh, declines. So all the rates of profit uh, uh declines and that's that's problematic and that's what you see kicking in at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 1970s and it's that um it's the kind of reassertion of the rate of the decline of the rate of profit that leads to a situation where um ruling classes across the uh, across the world start to think we've got to got to have a change we've got to have a break we've got to think about a new way of um of organizing the economy we've got to think about new methods of raising the uh the level of profitability we've got to attack the trade unions we've got to privatize sections of the economy to find new sources of profit we've got to uh try and deal with inflation um these are things that are fundamentally generated by that crisis of profitability that i think became a became a talking point very much in the early 70s now I know another uh, concept on which a lot of your book revolves uh, and which you've also brought up a couple of times already is the concept of neoliberalism. Uh, so I see the term neoliberal and its variation being used a lot uh, and in seemingly different ways uh, by, for example, political analysts or by journalists. Uh, and sometimes it's unclear just what's being meant by it. I have this long standing debate with a bunch of other friends on, on whether uh, uh, the term neoliberalism actually picks out anything that's distinctive to contemporary capitalism or whether all of the features that people say are just are definitive of neoliberal capitalism are actually just say prolongations of tendencies that were that have always been in capitalism um well along those lines then uh just what do what, what do you mean when you talk about neoliberalism or neoliberal capitalism and in your view what makes it distinctive from previous forms of capitalism well, I think it's distinctive from the um, from the phase of capitalism that ended in the in the early seventies, um, in a number of ways. It, it's an, it was an evolving project, um, and it had a number. Of, it has had a number of different features to it. Clearly, early on, the sort of tight money supply was very important. It always involved. Um, uh, a conscious attempt to weaken the power of the trade unions. The, the issue of privatization came up fairly early in the 1980s as a, a way of finding new markets uh, for uh, the capital. The, the internationalization, both of um, trade and of production, became a feature of it um, fairly early on uh, as well. The deregulation of the financial markets was also um, seen as became very central to it in the 1980s as well. So I think it was 
an emerging project. Obviously, it wasn't something that was uh, that kind of was created fully formed. It was an emerging project that used a number of different strategies to try and increase the rate of exploitation and to try and uh, and overcome the problems I've talked about the sclerosis of the of the um, of, of, of the rate of profit that was marked across the system at the time. There's two things I think we need to be careful about here more generally. One is I've got sympathy in what you're saying. That I think it's very important to recognise that um, it wasn't and isn't a completely new world. Where there's, there's, there's more continuity than there is change. Um, it was uh, a break from the kind of state capitalist model, if you want to call it that, of the of the of the period after the Second World War. Um, but it's not in any way a kind of new form of economic um, organization, a, a novel form of economic organization. It was a way of increasing exploitation. It was a way of um, deepening the uh, and widening um, the uh, uh, capitalist economy, bringing new sectors into capitalist uh, 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 world. And in that sense, you know, it was a it, it was not a fundamentally new um, new system. It was just a new way of organizing exploitation. I think it's important also to, to point out that what happened in the 70s wasn't really a counter-revolution. Sometimes it's posed in terms of being a counter-revolution. I don't agree with that because I think that, you know, the, the period before was not a time when um, workers had any control over society. It wasn't a time when uh, 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 equality, it wasn't the time um, when... Uh, the planning of society was in uh, under democratic control. The, in the period of the long boom, the capitalists were doing very, very nicely. Thank you very much. They were making super profits. They were very much in control of society. They did make some concessions and they did uh, regard it as being in their interest to generate the welfare state uh, for all sorts of reasons and to have some elements of national planning uh, to varying degrees in different parts of the world. But the fact that some sectors of capitalist society were planned from above didn't make them socialist in any way. I mean, mostly those sectors that were planned were sectors that weren't be weren't particularly profitable for the capitalists, but were nevertheless essential for the continuation of national capitalism. So you had, you know, in Britain, you had the mines were nationalised, but that was partly because they weren't making a huge amount of money for anyone. Uh, in the period uh, when they were nationalised after the Second World War. Um, the National Health Service, very important. But from the point of view of the bosses, yeah, it was partly a, a response to a popular demand for improvements and change, but also it was in their interest, particularly in a period of high profitability, to have a well-looked-after, relatively well-looked-after healthy workforce, new skills required, you know, um, a, a workforce that had the the capacity to um, to work, um, you know, for longer periods of their lives, and so on and so forth. So, um, neoliberalism wasn't a counter revolution. Neoliberalism was a, a response, as I say, to capitalist crisis. It was an attempt to get back to um, uh, higher levels of profitability. I think the way it's turned out, unsurprisingly has been that it's unleashed a kind of short-termist kind of um, cowboy capitalism that has been incredibly damaging. It's caused absolute mayhem for populations around the world. Uh, it's leading to a situation where, you know, environmental degradation and war uh, are uh, on the agenda in very, very frightening way. And the final thing I'd say about neoliberalism, which is um, sometimes kind of something that's ignored, but I think it's very important, that this, it's, it's brutal, short-termist, um, kind of naked capitalist nature has led to a situation where um, 
I think there's a kind of legitimacy problem to attack this system in a way that there hasn't been really since the, the 1960s. You know, you've had the emergence of anti-capitalism. We've had the emergence of a mass anti-war movement. Look at country after country. All the polls show very low levels of um, respect for parliament, for capitalist institutions, for police forces, for media, for business. You know, even the, the, the billionaires meeting up in Davos every year. They always kind of have this session where they talk about, oh, no one loves us. You know, we've got big credibility problems. And I think this is true. I think there's a huge amount of bitterness and anger, often unfocused and not necessarily clearly articulated, but nevertheless, very much a product of the failures and the miseries and the um, brutality of the neoliberal regime. And that's something the left needs to be very aware of. Um, that you know, there's a huge level of discontent in society. And, and I talk about this in the book. I mean, it's very interesting when you look at the opinion polls. I mean, despite, in some ways, a relative weakness of the left, the number of people who self-identify as socialists in the US or in Britain is, is, quite, is off the scale. I mean, you know, a majority of people under the age of 35 in the United States, when asked, believe socialism would be better than capitalism. I mean, yeah, this is an extraordinary thing. But I, I think... always find things like that, uh, uh, I, I'm skeptical, at least, of uh, the the rates at which people are currently reporting to the, themselves to be socialist. Uh, and the reason I'm skeptical of it is this. Uh, Bernie Sanders <laughs> calls himself a socialist. But when asked in an interview what this means, he said, I want, I want to be perfectly clear. <laughs> He, he clarified that his kind of socialism is in no way capitalist. So I, I worry when I hear about these rates at which people are identifying as socialist, whether they mean it in the sense in which, say, we do, or whether they mean it in this Bernie Sanders sense of something yeah. that can coexist alongside capitalism. No, I agree with you, Kenny. But I mean, you know, even if they just mean it in the Bernie Sanders sense, that's still pretty massive. You know, because what you're talking, and, and, and it's pretty massive for two reasons. One is it is just a kind of uh, re-emergence of uh, a, a social democratic consciousness uh, amongst young people, or not just young people, actually. I mean, it's, it, it, these figures are quite high right across the age range. So there's that. But also there's, there's another point here which is important, which is that, in my opinion, um, even the kind of Sanders called in uh, type project, um, well, A, would be very good if it managed to be implemented because it would make life a whole lot better for millions and millions of people. And B, I don't think it can be implemented without massive resistance from uh, those that have power in society. And I think what's happened in the last few years has proved that point. And so therefore, you know, however limited this socialist consciousness may be, and I would, you know, I, I wouldn't want to downplay it, but even whatever the kind of limitations of it, it is in, um, it's in a uh, complete kind of on a collision course with what the ruling classes are going to allow to happen without a big fight. And so, you know, consciousness is a very, man's consciousness is a very kind of volatile thing. It's not, it's not fixed. It changes through experience and through um, process of struggle. And I think one, bit, one thing that's happening right now in some parts of the world at least is that, is that and certainly in Britain, is that for a while people felt, okay, we've got Jeremy Corbyn, we've got the Corbyn project, that's what's going to bring us change. And we want it. People, millions of people were massively enthusiastic about it. Don't forget 13 million people voted for Corbyn at his most radical in 2017. Well, now people are beginning to say, well, hang on a minute, maybe we can't get it that way. Maybe we can't get it through Parliament. Maybe what we need to do is to fight for it a bit more ourselves. And that's the trajectory or one element of the trajectory that's happening now with these strikes. People are learning that and have learned we're going to have to fight for this stuff ourselves. And that's a very important lesson. Well, I know that you have, uh, in particular, a history of involvement with British Trotskyism. Uh, but despite this, in, in radical chains, uh, 
the main authors, at least if I've read it right, on, on whom you rely in this book, apart, of course, from Marx and Engels, uh, are Gramsci and Luca. Uh, what do you think their work gives us today in terms of analyzing and responding to contemporary class oppression? Well, I mean, I mean, there's three, uh, you know, the, the, I draw on a lot of people, a lot of yeah. um, experience in the book, but there's, there are three books in particular, three big books in the 20th century that I do name check. It's been quite for um, the Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution, Lukács' uh, History in Class Consciousness, and Gramsci's Prison Notebooks. And I do that because I think they're all three books that address um, in different ways, um, but very important ways. You know, what is one of the most essential questions that's thrown up in this whole discussion, which is, okay, suppose for a moment people agree with me that the working class has grown, that the working class is still objectively a massive force in society, the workers still have huge amounts of power um, if they choose to use them. Um, how is this going to play out in reality? It, there's a working class with tremendous power. Under what conditions does the working class begin to come, become conscious of its power? The workers start to actually use that power. And this all builds on um, a, 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 a thought that Marx had back um, in the 1840s when he talked about uh, the difference between the class in itself and the class for itself. You know, the objective reality, the existence of a growing working class on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, the development of class consciousness and, and the ability and the desire to use that, uh, to use um, uh, the power that comes from being a working class. And those are two things, two separate things. They're connected, but they're separate. And not all the, 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 the relationship between these two things, the objective reality of class and the willingness of working people to use that power, to use its, its position, is explored in different ways in all these three books. The, the, uh, Trotsky's book really draws out the lessons of the Russian Revolution uh, and the relationship between, you know, potential for workers to take action and um, their actual uh, uh, combativity and the success or failure of revolutionary movements. You have Gramsci in the prison notebook talked a lot about really looking back on the Russian Revolution and the period of uh, militancy and radicalization that, that spread around the world after the Russian Revolution and tried to draw lessons about how the working class could begin to lead um, mass movements in um, what are regarded as being or and lead successful mass movements in more developed capitalist societies. And then you have Lukács again looking back at the period and trying to understand how class consciousness develops, under what conditions it does develop, and 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 how it can be um how it can be encouraged. And I suppose one aspect of this discussion that's important is that Gramsci talked about contradictory consciousness uh under capitalism. And he talked about the way in which Capitalism uh, both brings workers together, uh, concentrates people in, in factories or uh, logistics hubs, as we talked about, big workplaces where people clearly have power to, um, to, uh, to, to bring sections of industry uh, to a standstill. But it also atomizes people. It collectivizes on the one hand and atomizes on the other because of the whole issue of competition. Uh, is the way in which um, uh, the way in which the exploitation is kind of hidden, in a way, by uh, the whole process of uh, of the capitalist economy. Under feudalism, it was obvious that you know you were spending some part of your day uh, or some part of your month producing goods for the lord because the lord would come along with his uh, entourage on horseback every month or whatever, and take a lot of your, you know, produce that your agricultural produce that you'd actually been involved in growing, and take it up to his castle. 
that price is a little bit hidden under capitalism. You know, you think you're going to work for yourself, for your fair day's work, for a fair day's pay. And the way in which actually what happens in the capitalist process of exploitation is a process of robbery. It's a little bit concealed because the profits aren't actually, um, aren't actually uh, uh, accumulated by the boss until the goods that you produce end up on the market. And there's a kind of uh, elongation of the process of exploitation, which to some extent hides what's going on, hides the robbery at, at the, the heart of capitalism. Now, these are issues that were uh, examined to some extent by Gramsci, but also perhaps in um, most detail by Lukács, building on Marx, the whole way in which powerlessness, of, um, the perception of powerlessness that you have in your workplace can have an effect of demoralizing work, working class people as part of the, um, the experience of capitalism. Um, this is a very important aspect, one side of the experience of, of being a worker under capitalism is the other side, which is the experience of collective struggle. But the two coexist, and I think these three books are in there because they all in different ways look at this contradiction and try and work out ways of overcoming them uh, and try and develop a kind of socialist strategy out of this contradiction, how best to increase the confidence of workers to struggle, how it is that in the periods of workers' struggle, you get not just an increase in, um, in workers' parent society, but an increase in um, radical consciousness. How should socialists relate to this fact? I mean, this is one of the really central insights, actually, of Marx himself was that revolution is important, revolutionary struggle is important, not just because it is the way that capitalism can be challenged, but because it is also the way in which the ideas generated under capitalism are also challenged, the, the, the circumstances in which people transform themselves, the circumstances in which people actually learn about the way capitalism operates. And this idea of struggle and self-organisation uh, and protests and strikes being essential to the creation of a radical consciousness is right at the heart of all these three books. I believe it's right at the heart of Marxism as well. And I think it's something that, you know, the kind of Keynesian or the social democratic or the left reformist the electoral projects that we talked about really don't factor in at all. And it, in some ways it's their essential weakness. The rad radical consciousness a kind of understanding of the, how, the way capitalism works is more than anything the product of, of class struggle and, and, you know, big participatory social movements as well. And this seems to me to be an absolutely central insight that has to be at the heart of any kind of socialist project. And it's, and it's something that's, that's, that's constantly underplayed in my view. Well, I think we've just got time for one more question before we finish up. Uh, so I'd like to go back to something I said at the beginning. Uh, I mentioned that Radical Change is going to be your, your fourth book published with us at Zero Books. Uh, the previous three being The People versus Tony Blair, How the Establishment Lost Control, and The British State, A Warning. I, I previously had uh, the Canadian Maoist Josh Mofwad Paul on our channel, uh, and he's published several books with us as well. Uh, I found it interesting hearing from him about kind of the internal relation between all his books, uh, with one offering, say, a history of Maoism, and another, the historical foundations, or sort of the theoretical foundations underlying that account of history that he gives of Maoism, and so on. Uh, is there any relation between your latest book, Radical Chains, uh, and the previous books that you put forward with Verso? Well, I mean, they're all about very different subjects clearly you know there's one is the history of the anti-war movement and some of the lessons from that um how the establishment lost control is an account of um the kind of post-2008 crisis of legitimacy in um in uh western capitalism really certainly in britain um and the british state kind of speaks for itself 
I think there are some underlying themes, though, continuities. I think you're right, um, and concerns. And I suppose uh, one of them is that I want to stress the, um, the underlying importance of the experience of living under capitalism, the kind of questions that we just talked about. Uh, in, ter- uh, 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 in terms of the generation of, of, of mass consciousness, because there's a big emphasis, which is kind of understandable, but um, I think it's overplayed on uh, the media, on education, on kind of capitalist propaganda, if you like, uh, in many of the models um, and many of the discussion about you know, what shapes people's ideas in society. And you can see that in, obviously, Chomsky is very influential. You can see it actually in Mark Fisher in some ways as well, in a slightly different way. Um, And at its most extreme, you get this uh, view that neoliberalism has kind of generated a, 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 a neoliberal consciousness. It's kind of entered our brains and it's completely kind of taken over the way we think about the world. Um, and in all all the books that I've written, I will I, I'm, I, I stress the, the the fact that working class experience precisely is contradictory, and uh, actually the reality of living under capitalism in itself, by and large, does have a radicalising effect on working class people. And if you look at the polling, okay, we can discuss what it exactly means to say that I'm a socialist when people say I would like to see socialist change. But if you dig down deeper, you will find that in most countries, working class people are way to the left, uh, at least on the basic social and economic issues, of um, normally of the main political parties in society. You know, workers want more redistribution of wealth. They want more taxation for the rich. They want more public spending. They want a, a better um, national health service. They want more rights to trade unions. You know, you look at almost any time, uh, since polls of certain social attitude surveys have been taken, you will find that workers have quite progressive views on all these things. Um, I mean, even in the darkest days of Thatcherism in Britain, the truth is workers, the majority of working people, did not sign up to the Thatcherite agenda. It's just the fact. They were opposed to privatisation. They thought the attacks on trade unions were wrong. And, you know, this is a very, very important thing because it provides a baseline for um, the consciousness on which the left bill. And I think this is kind of something that has been, uh, that is too often ignored. Connected to that, uh, another thing that I come back to, I think, in, in at least two or three of the books is a kind of pessimism of the intellectuals, if you like, uh, which I think is partly a product of, you know, the defeat, obviously, of the, the successive and very serious defeats in the working class movement in the last 40 years. It's understandable. Um, but I also think it's a product of the uh, academicization of Marxism, the fact that Marxism has kind of taken root under the, in the neoliberal years or taking refuge in the academy and the universities and stuff. And I think that has served to distance it from uh, working class reality and working class struggle in ways that have been quite damaging. So you get a situation where, uh, you know, a whole range of different left voices and intellectuals and writers and academics have basically abandoned the working class over the last 40 years and re- talked about, you know, a society in which um, uh, people see themselves as consumers, don't self-define as workers, uh, don't see themselves as workers, uh, are in some way incorporated into neoliberal society, brought into it. Uh, You see all these different theories where, you know, um, the, the reality of Precarity has meant that people aren't working class anymore, or that that, that section of the working class that has full time jobs is in some ways privileged. We see the emergence of this idea that, you know, your identity uh, is more important than the actual um, 
economic reality of your position in society. So, you know, the whole question of identitarian politics, which is coming to, to dominate. All this has been a move away from class and a move away from um, the idea, as I said at the beginning of the interview, the idea that we can have fundamental change, that we can have, a, a, you know, a transformational project. Um, and I think this is all very, very damaging. Um, and when you actually look at the reality of what working class people think, you find, as I say, not just that um, most working class people have pretty progressive ideas, pretty progressive attitudes on most issues, but also the majority of people uh, in Britain, for example, and in most other uh, capitalist societies, the majority of people self-define as working class. I mean, it's very, very interesting. The number of people, the proportion of the population that define themselves as working class in Britain has hardly changed since 1979. It's basically 60%. You know, so there's a kind of, I'm, I worry about a, 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 a gap between where the left is at and where working people are at. And I think it's very, very important that, you know, we, we, we temper some of the pessimism that's come from this separation and this, this uh, distinction. And then we, we recognize that not just the working class exists, not just that it has grown, not that just that uh, working people have a huge amount of power in the society that we live in today, but also the working people are very, very angry and feel totally um, unrepresented by the kind of right of moving social democracy, um, that feel out of touch with the, with the left because the left isn't quite understanding just how angry people are and just how uh, much people yearn for some kind of change, even if there's not a clear idea about how that change should come. Nevertheless, I think people more and more are beginning to understand that the current system cannot carry on, that the state of affairs that we're living in is dysfunctional, is uh, unacceptable, that the system is no longer providing the basics for people, even in the developed world, the so-called developed world. And I think the left has to overcome its pessimism and overcome the idea the working class doesn't exist anymore, recognize that working people want to have change and uh, get involved in the struggles that are, ha that are beginning to happen, but openly try and say, okay, we we're beginning to fight back now. What are we fighting for? Let's take these fights over pay. Uh, let's take these fights over working conditions. And let's recognize that they also represent a very, very deep-seated anger against the whole way the system is operating at the moment. And that, to me, provides opportunity. It provides um, a, uh, uh, some openings for the land. If we're well enough organized, if we're dynamic enough, and if we um, shrug off the pessimism that I still think is um, a characteristic of too many parts of the land. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think we're just out of time. So uh, it'd be great if just before we uh, end this call, you could tell people about uh, a little bit about what you have going on at the moment. I know just before we started our conversation, you mentioned some of the work that you're doing with the Stop the War Coalition. And obviously you have this book that's coming out in May. Yeah, well, the book's coming out. Um, I'll obviously be doing lots of uh, book launches and, and stuff and um, promoting the book in as many ways as I can. Um, yeah, I'm uh, the vice chair of the Stop the War Coalition. Uh, one of the big challenges we have, I think, is um, at the moment in the movement is that while we have a return to strike action and quite a strong mood for change in British society at the moment, we also have this situation where our establishment, the Tories and the, the ruling class in general, is trying to get us more and more involved in this war, um, uh, supporting the war, uh, against Russia and uh, supporting the Ukrainians against the, the Russian invasion. And while we obviously have to condemn the Russian invasion, I think that, um, you know, ramping up military support, NATO support for the Ukrainians is a recipe for disaster because it's going to be the Ukrainians, you know, if the war escalates, if the war continues, it's going to be the Ukrainians who suffer first and foremost, but also 
this confrontation does raise the prospect of, you know, escalating war across the region. Obviously, the, the danger of nuclear confrontation is more real now than it has been any time since the 1960s, the Cuban Missile Crisis, at least. So it is quite an urgent situation. So we're mobilizing. Uh, there's an international day against the war for peace negotiations um, at the end of this month, on the 25th of February. We're involved in mobilizing for that as part of um, trying to strengthen the movement against the government in this country, really. Well, with that as a last note, thank you so much again for joining us, Chris. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. I can't wait for the books to come out in May. And best luck with all the work that you're doing with the Stop the War Coalition. Well, great to talk to you, Kenny. Thanks very much. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.